Hi, and welcome to the Passionistas Project podcast, where Amy and Nancy Harrington, and our guest today is Melody Godfred, founder of Fred and Far, a self-love movement. Through her own journey of self-discovery, Melody found a way to remind all women to make a pinky promise to choose themselves each and every day by wearing a self-love pinky ring. We spoke with her several months ago for our blog, and we were so inspired by that conversation that we couldn't wait to have her on our podcast. So please welcome to the show, Melody Gottfried. Thank you. What are you most passionate about? I'm most passionate about helping people discover their personal narratives and use that as a source of power in their lives. So tell us what a personal narrative is. We oftentimes try to segment ourselves into boxes and try to say, well, I'm this, but I'm that, and everything's disjointed, and we lose sight of the fact that we are so unique and that it's the culmination of all those different experiences and character traits that allow us to make a mark on the world in a way that no one else can. And so what I really take pride in is helping people discover that about themselves and that instead of trying to put themselves into boxes, the good parts, the bad parts, kind of embracing all of it and realizing that, wow, it's the sum of all these things that makes me, me, and my me is extraordinarily powerful. So how do you help people discover that? The first step is, you know, what we discovered with Fred and Far is it's as simple as making a choice. I think the notion that you can actually choose yourself as opposed to waiting for some milestone to define you or waiting for someone to choose you or waiting to get a promotion to define your worth. You know, oftentimes we look externally. And so my job is to help people see themselves as they are in the exact moment. So if that means I get a tribe member to share their story and I validate them in the moment and say, do you realize who you are? This is extraordinary. And it has nothing to do with you checking off boxes. It's about you claiming your own worth. And sometimes all it takes to empower someone is to witness them. And I get to do that every single day. What is a tribe member? Fred and Far is powered by a pinky ring. So in a way, people easily look at it and they're like, oh, it's a jewelry company. But in reality, it's a movement and it's fueled by women around the world who have made this commitment to themselves and to practicing self-love. So when women decide to join us, whether it's by following us on Instagram, purchasing a ring and making the commitment, or just reaching out to us and sharing their story, which a lot of women do, they become a part of our tribe. And this tribe really flourishes on Instagram especially, and it's a really interesting experiment in how social media can be exceptionally positive, because a lot of times social media is a place where people only express their high points and it is very alienating for other people. We actually showcase vulnerability as strength and so we're combating that and in the process building a community of women who support each other through the highs and lows of life. Let's take a step back in your personal journey. You started in a very different career and that led to what you're doing now. So can you talk a bit about that journey? I'm going to take it back even a little bit further. When I was a child, my identity was extremely clear to me. I was a musician. I was an artist. I was a creative. I often wonder if that was because my name was Melody and I was trying to lean into my name or if my name was somehow uh, my mom's vision of the future. She saw what was coming. Either way, um, I knew who I was and I knew what to pursue to make myself happy. And it had to do with, you know, sitting in front of the piano or singing a song. As I grew older, I felt I feel like my desire to prove myself took over. And so I started pursuing more intellectual pursuits which is what ultimately led me to law school. Um, I became a litigation attorney, and even though it was very fulfilling and stimulating in my mind, it was completely disconnected from my soul because where I thrive is in the space where I can be creative and collaborative, and you really can't do either of those things in law. And so I took a leap of faith. I left, I wrote and published a book as a way to reconnect with my creative spirit, and in the process realized that telling stories is what I love the most. And so the first company I started was Write in Color, which is a writing consultancy where I helped people tell their stories, whether they were individuals or businesses. And eventually that morphed into a career development company where it really is about helping individual people unlock their strongest stories and use it to create their dream careers. And um, even though that was an amazing experience and along the way I also got married and had kids, I found myself by 2015 in this place where 
I had checked off every box and I was completely unhappy and I didn't know why. And it took me taking a step back and realizing that I deserve a place in my own life to kind of plant the seeds that eventually became Fred and Far. But it all started with one ring. I put a ring on and every day when I looked at it, I reminded myself that I should choose myself. I should discover myself. I should reconnect with the parts of myself that are most authentic and fulfilling to me. And when it worked, when having this ring as a reminder worked for me, I thought it might help other women as well. And that's how Fred and Far started. How do you think wearing a pinky ring transforms a woman? First of all, the ring itself is infused with a lot of meaning and symbolism. So it's a little bit different than just any other piece of jewelry. We use the triangular shape throughout the design of the ring as a symbol of the divine feminine. It's the energy we have within all of us that sometimes gets quieted. And so I think the symbolism of the ring, especially if you know about it, when you purchase the ring is a big motivator. There's also something about tapping into this culture around jewelry. I think the engagement ring is a really good example of a ring that for centuries has represented a commitment. And women wear this ring not just as a reminder to themselves, but a symbol to society. And I think by creating this pinky ring, a new finger, a new design, something that really only stands for this one idea, women are tapping into this notion of self-commitment. Um, and so I think that's powerful as well. And ultimately, I think having a reminder helps. I think it's, we use our hands all day long. And every time you look down on it, it's a reminder to ask yourself, how have I chosen myself today? Have I practiced self-care? Am I experiencing my feelings in real time? Am I expressing myself? And what we do on our website and through our social media is give women the resources and tools to turn the commitment into something they can practice and explore on a daily basis. And that's a really important piece of it. It's really easy to tell someone here, wear this ring, choose yourself. But I think it's my responsibility and it's our responsibility as a company to give people resources for actually translating that into actions they can take on a daily basis. You personally practice this, but you also run two big companies. How do you find that balance between self-love and your typical work day? It's something that I think has a bit of a different answer on every, every day. I think treating myself with patience and flexibility has been incredibly important because no two days are gonna be alike. And sometimes there are things that take priority that I couldn't have anticipated. Early on, that would have given me a lot of anxiety. And now I've become much more fluid and I think self-love has a lot to do with that, not judging myself if everything doesn't happen according to plan, relinquishing this idea that any of us actually have control because none of us do, and also setting boundaries so that I'm positioned for success. I think early on when I started my first business, I believed that I owed my clients every ounce of my time and being at all moments. And so if I got an email at one o'clock in the morning and I happened to wake up to drink some water, I would answer it because I owed it to them. And that was the behavior that actually led me to the place where I needed the self-love pinky ring was because I had no boundaries and every moment of my life was devoted to fulfilling someone else's needs. So what I do on a daily basis is I think about what needs to be done and I try to prioritize the big picture as opposed to only getting consumed in the minutia of making it through the day. Um, and as long as I can balance those two things, at the end of the day, what's done is done and what isn't will be there the next day. And I think being forgiving towards yourself plays a big role in being a successful entrepreneur, mom, all the hats that I wear is just being really flexible and forgiving. What was the initial reaction to the pinky ring? We first launched in about February of 2015 with a very soft launch. We didn't even tell anybody what we were doing. We just put up a website, put up a few social media accounts, and we're like, okay, we'll see what's going to happen. And then it was in about May that we decided, you know what, we should try and see if we can get someone to write about this. And so we were lucky in that we connected with an editor at Racked. She wrote a piece, and what happened after that is something that I still pinch myself because we saw that that had been published and we were so excited. It was our first piece of real press. And then we set up our Google alerts and then over the course of the next 30 days, over a hundred different publications around the world from radio to print 
to digital outlets started writing about this movement, the self-love pinky ring. And uh, we went viral. And within three months, women in 30 countries had purchased rings through our website. And so we went from selling like a couple rings a week to selling a hundred rings in one day. And so it was extremely exciting. And at the same time, it forced us to kind of grow up and be like, okay, like this is a great concept. I get that a lot. People are like, oh, this is a great concept. But we had to deliver on the promise by actually having not only a great product and a great concept, but also great service. And that's something we really pride ourselves on is making sure that the experience lives up to the promise we're asking people to make. Since you're in so many countries, you must have a really interesting perspective on the commonality of women around the world. What do you find? That's been my favorite part is hearing people's stories. And sometimes it is tied into the countries that they live in. We got, you know, a story from a client, a customer who purchased a ring from Brazil. And she was saying how in her country, if you're not married by 25, you're considered a second class citizen as a woman. And, you know, in that regard, I was really happy to realize that even though there might be limitations that women face here, there are places where it's even worse. And to empower those women, and we've had women in you know, the Middle East and Abu Dhabi and you know, just places that really there's a stark difference between how men and women are treated and the opportunities that they're afforded. So there is a difference, but the commonality far outweighs that because regardless of what a woman's story is, whether she's a woman who's battling anxiety or depression and is deciding to choose herself, or she is a woman going into college and doesn't want to submit to peer pressure, or a woman who's seven years old and is a widow and wants to claim herself and really own her story for the first time in her life, every woman is the same in that once she makes the choice, magic is what ensues. And that transformative power of self-love and self-choice is something that every woman who's made the decision has experienced in a common way. How do women share their personal stories with you? I email personally every single customer and I welcome them and I ask them to share their story with me. We have a submission link on our website where people can submit either anonymously or with their names. I mean, uh, a story is just as powerful, even if a woman's not ready to associate her name with it. And then also on social media, women will share their stories and tag us or use our hashtags like hashtag Fred and Far or hashtag self love pinky ring. Um, so there are a variety of ways. Um, and we try to really encourage women to share because it's, wow, it's just, I can't even put it in words. It's amazing to see how women respond and support each other. So this idea of like women helping women, women supporting women, it happens with us every single day because when we share stories, the other women who read them are the ones who are like, you are amazing. And I think that cultivating that collaborative environment and energy among women is what's going to transform society. So once we all kind of come together, we're going to, we're going to shift the vibe of the world. It seems like you've created a really safe space yes. for women. How do you manage that? Part of it is uh, by being very clear on our value, values, by being very clear about what we stand for and being very consistent in our brand and our tone, we invite a certain kind of behavior and a certain kind of customer and a certain kind of person on social media. We have never once had someone leave a negative comment on someone's story, which is really powerful. And the same was true, you know, when we went viral all over Facebook. I mean, there were people who were like, this is, you know, I've been wearing a ring on my pinky forever. This doesn't mean anything. But that was really the extent of the negative feedback. At the end of the day, I think everyone immediately was like, wow, this is a great idea. Like, why shouldn't women have a vehicle for choosing themselves? It felt so natural. And I think that's why the, the reaction has been so positive is because we're not asking for there to be this really outlandish buy-in to something. Um, I think what we're trying to create in the world, the shift towards self-empowerment is something that really resonates with everyone. And how important do you think it is for you to be an identifiable face of your brand? I think it's very important. I think that the more I share myself in all moments, not just you know the done up moments when I'm doing an interview, but also in the moments where I'm feeling a little bit less than, 
I think it helps people realize that this is truly an extension of who I am and the work that I do is from a place of pure passion and love. And I think when people feel that, they're more likely to want to be part of it. Whereas if I hide myself and I make it feel very corporate, there's no reason for them to join me as opposed to just going to the mall and picking up a ring and putting it on. I think people trust me and I take that trust really seriously. And so I try to give my community exactly what I ask of them, which is authenticity, vulnerability, um, and transparency. What's the most important part of your daily routine? I need to see my kids every day. I think as a working mom, that's something that you could easily take for granted. And there have been days where I do, where I just, you know, say, you know, to my husband, can you put the kids to bed? I need to work late. And I've realized that when I do that a few too many times, I don't feel like myself. And I think it's really important to remember that, that women can have it all. You can work, you can have a career. You can't always have it all at the same time. And that's okay. And I'm not going to feel guilty about it. If I have to work a little less, but still get to see my kids and kiss them goodnight and read them a story, I'm going to do that because that's that a huge part of my identity and something that really gives me my life force, um, especially just the fact that they are being raised in an environment where they are subtly being taught to choose themselves. And so they teach me so much about self-awareness that half the things I'm posting on social media, I'm just repeating what these five-year-old girls are telling me. And so if I, if I don't spend that time with them, I definitely don't feel right. And do you consciously teach them about the fact that women can do anything? We don't have deliberate lesson plans, but when I see things happening in real time, I'm very careful about how I speak with them. For example, yesterday the girls were in karate and I've noticed that their sensei, who's a male, oftentimes will say to them, oh, silly girl. And it rubbed me the wrong way. And so I pulled one of my daughters aside and I said, it's okay for you to say to him, I'm not a silly girl, I'm a powerful woman. And uh, she looked at me and laughed and she goes, but sometimes I'm silly. And I'm like, and that's okay. But you should always feel comfortable to assert who you are and you're not just a silly girl. And so when I see an opportunity, I'm teaching them the words and the thinking that I hope will get them through life without needing to do a lot of recovery. Because a lot of women who join our movement, there is a huge amount of healing that needs to take place. And that's great. And I know that the ring and our community plays a huge role in helping them heal. My goal is to raise a generation of self-loving girls so that instead of healing, they are going into the world whole. And I'm just so curious to see the impact of that, a generation of whole women. How were you raised? What did your parents teach you about what a girl could and couldn't do? So I'm really fortunate in the sense that I was born in Iran and my parents fled the country because they wanted me to have access to a better life. And so I was raised by parents who valued my future enough as a woman to uproot their entire lives and start over in a new country. And so I think from birth, that's been a part of the legacy that I've had to live up to. And they've always made me feel that as a woman, as a person, I can conquer anything. Um, my parents, you know, my dad is an entrepreneur. My mom is also incredibly entrepreneurial. And so there was never a limit placed on me in any regard. And um, yeah, I never felt that there was a difference being a woman or a man. I, I really truly believe that I was lucky in that regard because a lot of times people who come from these more traditional cultures, there is a disparity and there's a difference in messaging. You know, it's more about, okay, you need to be careful and see who you're gonna marry. And, and for my parents, it was like, we're gonna see who's gonna marry you, like who's gonna get <laughs> lucky. Um, and I've been fortunate in that I found a partner who is my, equal and who raises me up and allows me to raise him up and we're building a family where gender isn't a defining characteristic. So it's exciting to pass that on and model that um, for our daughters. And for your son, right? Your, for, yeah. Yeah. Soon to be son. That's a really important element of it too. We, I think in this conversation we're having right now in the world, we're talking about girls and teaching girls, but it's just as important to educate the young boys too. I'm very excited about that. I think it's gonna be really powerful for me to have a boy when I'm in this space 
Because when I had my daughters, that was the catalyst for me to start my journey of self-discovery and self-love. And to now have a boy when I'm having gone through it and still continuing to go, go through it, but to be in a good place, I think is going to be extraordinarily powerful because a lot of my own healing has to do with what I went through as a lovesick teenager and with that dynamic with men from an early age, I had to heal all of that. So now to have the ability to raise a man who feels whole himself and you know goes out into the world and treats women and his peers with respect and love um, is going to be a really interesting experience. You're listening to the Passionistas Project podcast and our interview with Melody Godfred, founder of Fred and Far. Check out her line of empowering self-love pinky rings at fredandfar.com. Do you ever feel unmotivated or have a creative block and how do you get past that? Creative block, yes. Um, I think the best way to deal with a creative block is to lean into it. I think creativity is a habit and it's a muscle and oftentimes we're taught that it's like divine intervention and it can be taken away from you. And so when I feel blocked, I, I challenge myself to just do something, whether it's coming up with a quote to post on social because everything we post for the most part is original. Some days I don't feel like it, but I will just sit down and be like, you know what? There is something in you that needs to be said. You need to find it. Um, and so I think with regard to creativity, once you feel blocked, the best thing to do is to push a little harder. But in terms of needing time off, you know, it's really easy to preach self-care. It's not always easy to practice it. Yesterday was a good example. I was on my feet and running from like 8.30 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. And I had a horrible night's sleep. I'm eight months pregnant and I just should not be doing that. And so, you know, I had something scheduled for tomorrow that I knew was going to take a lot of energy and I canceled it and I'm going to lay in bed instead. And I think you just have to be able to do that. You have to hear what your body is telling you and adjust accordingly. And it goes back to that idea of being flexible with yourself and your schedule. Do you have a mantra that you live by? Yes, I have a few that I think really ground me on a daily basis. One is to see what's there instead of what's missing. This was a huge shift for me because I come from a long line of self-sacrificing martyrs who are a little bit of a control freak and need everything to be perfect and are willing to kill themselves to get there. That was what I was taught a woman is. And so now, you know, I focus on what's there. I don't see the cracks and I used to only see the cracks and it was destroying my life. And so now that is one mantra that really grounds me on a daily basis. Another is gratitude over guilt. And what that means is whatever moment I'm in, I try to have gratitude for that moment instead of feeling guilty about what I'm not doing or what I'm missing or what was or wasn't done. I ground myself using gratitude and I completely free myself of guilt or shame. And so I think the combination of those two things have given me the ability to experience happiness in my life. And I think that really is the catalyst for all good things. What's been the biggest challenge for you in all of this professionally? Not being hard on myself, because even though I have two businesses, there are days where I look at myself and I feel like a complete failure because ever since I was a child, I never felt like I truly lived up to my potential. I always felt like I was almost there, but not quite. And I think anyone looking from the outside would say, you're crazy. Like you, you're there. Like you accomplish what everyone wishes they could accomplish. And there are days where I feel like all I do is fail and all I do is make mistakes. And so combating that kind of self-talk is, is a part of my daily existence. What's the most rewarding part of your job? Getting an email from a woman who's, who just tells me their story and tells me that the ring changed their lives. I'm so fortunate and that the feedback I get is so consistent and so authentic and full of love. I'll get Instagram direct messages where people say, you know, the world is a better place because of you keep doing what you're doing. And what more can you ask for than that, than to feel like you've made an impact on the world and you've made a contribution. So that is extremely rewarding. Is there one story that sticks out to you as the one that really resonates with you? 
I mean, it's a, it's a little bit uh, graphic, but you know, a woman reached out to me a couple months ago because she had been gang raped on her college campus. And uh, she was finally nearing the place after joining our community and hearing the stories and buying her ring where she was like, you know what, I'm ready. I'm ready to tell my story. And she did. And we shared her story um, on our website and on our social media. And what I thought was really profound is she then shared that blog post with her friends and family. And instead of hiding in shame and letting this experience define her, she owned it and shared it and didn't hide behind it. And the comments her friends and family left and the comments our community left. And I mean, there were women who were like, wow, this happened to me and I've never talked about it before. And so that one has really stuck with me because if you can help someone claim themselves after going through something like that, there's no limit to what I think we can do as a community to help women around the world um, own their worth and not hide in shame when things don't go as planned. What's the main focus of most of these stories? I think a lot of them uh, have challenging elements, but all of them have a triumphant note because the very act of choosing themselves is a victory for these women, even if they haven't necessarily experienced the complete change that they're hoping for, they all have a positive tone. Um, and so whether it's recovering from a breakup or you know, starting over as a single mom, um, every woman who tells her story, it has a triumphant tone, even though it may recount a really tragic history. Um, yeah. And, you know, just this week we shared a woman and story. She was turning 18 and she was buying a self-love pinky ring because she wanted to treat herself and she was excited to be 18 and to have self-love be part of that. And there was nothing tragic about that at all. It was just pure joy. And we, it's really important to share those stories as well, because not every woman is defined by tragedy. Um, every woman is defined by her choice. And so that's really what we try to highlight is that moment of self-love and, and choice. Are you finding more and more younger women getting involved? There's always a range. It's, it always blows me away. I mean, we've had uh, multi-generational stories where women will buy rings for their mothers and grandmothers and sisters and all make the commitment together. And so then you have people in, in their early 20s ranging through their 80s who are joining together. Um, I'd say the vast majority of women who join kind of fall in the middle. Um, but I think one of our initiatives is trying to figure out how do we connect with younger girls sooner so that, like I said, it's less about healing and more about writing a story um, that's defined by self-love from the very beginning. You've talked about your mother a little bit already. What other female role models have you had? I come from a very strong uh, matriarchal uh, family. And so there are a lot of different women within my family who have played a big role. I also think that my teachers throughout my life um, who have been women have played a really big role in shaping me and seeing the seeds of talent and passion within me and nurturing that. So whether it was my piano teacher that I started with when I was seven and she was the one who embedded me with this idea that I could be a composer at seven and she was helping me you know, notate and record music um, at a time when most people would say like, who are you to write music? You're seven years old. But she saw that in me and she nurtured it to my fifth grade teacher, Miss Stein, who nurtured in me a passion for reading um, that has stayed with me now throughout my life. I think there have been a number of women throughout high school, college, law school, you know, these teachers who just saw something in me and took the extra step um, to nurture me. Um, they've all left an indelible mark. And what I try to do now is just to pay that forward. Anytime I have an opportunity to teach or empower girls and, you know, help them claim their intrinsic power and values, I really gravitate towards those opportunities because it made such a big difference in my life. Do you still find time to do music at all? I have a piano <laughs> and I bought it because I thought, how could I live in a home without a piano? It was such a big part of my life. Um, when my daughters were born, music made a big resurgence. I would play the piano for them and sing to them every single day. And then, you know, kind of lulled a little. And so I'm excited now for my son. I think it'll be another opportunity to reconnect with music because 
lately my creativity has been more in a written format um, because I'm creating content on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, music is so embedded in my DNA that I'm excited to get back to it again. I know it's coming. What style of music do you play and sing? So I'm classically trained um, and I have a really good ear, so I can pretty much play anything. Um, a lot of it is just, you know, elevated versions of Disney classics right now. But yeah, there is no limit. I think what's great about my musical taste is that it's broad. Did you have any cultural heroines growing up, people you saw in pop culture that inspired you? I mean, when I was in second grade, I wanted to be Whitney Houston. I thought I was going to be a singer and she was the best singer and uh, that's all I wanted. Um, and then from then on out, you know, it shifted a little. I think my icons became more literary in nature. You know, like Joan Didion, for example, uh, is a master memoir writer. And I think now all of my heroines have to do with women who are able to tell their stories. Um, most recently, I read a book by Danny Shapiro, and she wrote this heart-wrenching but totally soul-lifting memoir about her marriage. And so, you know, I think I gravitate towards strong women who unapologetically tell their stories. I think they are the ones who are inspiring me the most right now. What's your definition of success? This is something I struggle with because there's a part of me that wants to say that success is simply um, setting out to do something and doing it with integrity and making an impact. And I know for sure that I have done that. Um, and then there's another part of me that says self, uh, self-sufficiency is success, having security, stability, making sure that financially you can provide for yourself and for your kids. And I live in Los Angeles and I'm about to have three kids and that's a tall order. I mean, I look at my parents' generation and they came here with nothing. And I just wonder, how did they do that? It is so hard. And I think balancing those two things of doing meaningful work and also being financially stable and feeling safe, if you can balance those two things, I think that is the ultimate definition of success. With this project, we're talking to women who are following their passions and not necessarily defining success by money or fame. Yeah, but I think it's important to, to balance that against being able to take care of yourself because I think a lot of times uh, this is a time period where people are told, follow your passions, do what makes you happy. And if you only do that and you're not mindful of being responsible with your finances and doing financial planning, you're going to set yourself up for a lot of pain. And once you're there, there's nothing that you're going to be able to do to make yourself happy. So I think it's really important, especially with younger kids, to embed them with this idea that you can have both. You have to do the work. You have to find a way to balance the two because taking a job that sucks your soul out is not going to make you happy and it's not going to be something you can sustain. I learned that as a litigation attorney. I was making a great salary at a prestigious firm and I literally could feel my soul floating over my head, shaking its head on a daily basis. Um, and so that wasn't sustainable. And then on the other end of the spectrum, when I was writing my book and I thought, okay, I'm going to write this book. It's going to become a bestseller. I'm going to you know, become a world around author. When that didn't exactly happen as I had planned, I couldn't just say like, well, I'm just going to be a starving artist and write. I found a way to balance my passion with, for writing with a sustainable career for myself. And I started a writing company and I was fulfilled and I was able to take care of myself. So I think that's a really important message is you have to challenge yourself to balance the two. You've done so many things. What do you consider your proudest career achievement? I really think the self-love pinky ring is what I'm most proud of. Um, to have created a symbol that's resonated with thousands of women around the world and empowered them to take a step forward in their lives that's defined by self-worth, self-love, and self-choice, I think is something that I'm super proud of. Also because I always thought prior to that, well, I can render a great service. Like I can be a business consultant, which I've been. I could be a lawyer. I could help someone write something wonderful, but I can't sell a product. That's just too scary. Um, and to have been able to manifest something that started out as just like a sketch on a piece of paper and now know that women can literally put it on every day and, and honor the in same intention that I had when I created it, I think is a really powerful moment. And I take a lot of pride in being able to have to say that I've created something. What's your advice to a woman who wants to be an entrepreneur? Just get started. 
I think one of the biggest things women do especially is they limit themselves and they second guess themselves and they find reasons not to get started. Um, the logo is not good enough. The website isn't pretty enough. The plan isn't clear enough. And we just get in our own way. I think there's something to be said for just starting with a minimum viable product and making it better. I'll, I'll give you the caveat that I think that in choosing what that product or service is, the more authentic you can be, the more it's going to resonate and the better it's going to do. So think about yourself. What do you need? What do you like? What is your story? And how can you turn that into a business? If you start from that place of authenticity and you have integrity in what you're trying to create, instead of just thinking, oh, somebody might buy this, you know, if you really dig deep and think to yourself, what does the world need that I can uniquely contribute? Then the rest is just a matter of trial and error. We live in an extraordinary time where you have the world as your audience and they're just a click away and there are so many resources. There isn't this huge barrier to entry. So I think it's a two-step thing. First, figure out what you're passionate about and then two, get started. Thanks for listening to the Passionistas Project podcast and our interview with Melody Godfred. If you want to learn more about Fred and Farr and the self-love pinky rings, visit fredandfarr.com. And be sure to follow Melody's social media pages and subscribe to the Passionistas Project podcast so you don't miss any of our upcoming inspiring guests. We actually have one last question, which is, will you be our new best friend? <laughs> oh, done and done. We'll make a pinky promise nice. on it.